and underneath it. Oh, great. Uh, um, and then underneath it, it, it says, uh, uh, composed in Terezin, it gives the date, November 30th, uh, 1942. Uh, it says for men's choir in Hebrew, and then composed by Pavel Haas, dedicated to Otter Zucker. <clears throat> so this gives one view of Terezin. Now, it's filled with cryptic, codes of all kinds at various moments, as we'll see a couple of them, uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, as I suggest, it, it was a place where there was a fine dance between revealing and obscuring. And here in this kind of cryptic look-alike, looks like notes is, is, is the Hebrew message. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But the piece is called al Safod, uh, and it's a, a kind of labor Zionist hymn, as it were, by a poet named David Shimoni, and it says, do not despair, do not, do not let down, uh, you have to work, you have to work, avod, avod, work, work. Um, and I, I wanted to look at this moment somewhat near the end, to, to give another aspect, another look at Terezin composition. So as you can see, it's uh, transliterated Hebrew. The text at this point is Vetsoek Hadam Benishmat Ha'am, and the blood cries out to the soul of the people. So this would in any sense be thought of as a kind of climax. Uh, the blood cries out. And, and indeed, you have a rising motive uh, with some strength in it. Um, but I'm going to play a couple of recordings and ask you to, to think about it. So here's the first recording of this passage. <laughs> There's nothing particularly wrong with it, except Haas in the score here has asked for a crescendo, right? It's supposed to be a crescendo. So let's listen to the second recording. <laughs> There's no crescendo at all. <laughs> There's no change at all. And not only that, it's very slow. And here's a third recording. Well, that gets louder on the second soek. And I think we also have to understand that, you know, uh, composers rewrite texts, not necessarily by adding words, but by deciding what to repeat. So if you repeat a text, it gives it a centrality. And this, in the poem, this occurs with soek Adam only once. He repeats it twice. But if you look at what he does, I know this is a subtle point for some of you, but I hope it'll take. First of all, there is a crescendo right here, and it goes to mezzo forte. So if, you, if you're at the end of your crescendo reaching mezzo forte, that means it has to start pretty softly. But there's something else that I think is really, to me, Terezini, and that's written above this goal after the crescendo is the word Dolce. Now, Dolce is one of several kind of expressive words that can composers put in scores. Uh, we don't know what expression actually means, but we know that thousands and thousands of markings and thousands of scores say espressivo, amoroso, Dolce. And so at this very moment, it, it pulls back. And I, I think this kind of ambivalence, ambiguity, is, is one of the things that you find so often in these Terezin scores that, that makes them tricky to interpret. Uh, so before I actually go on to my next slide, I'm going to play you uh, the material from that next slide. This is a, a different composition. It's a piano composition by Victor Ullmann. So now 
I'm going to show you the next slide. I have to apologize in advance for this next slide. It's going to look very busy to you, <clears throat> but I hope by the end uh, you will feel it's a little less busy. So here we go. See, it's busy. All right. So this passage, which you just heard, is to me really one of the remarkable passages in Western music. It's, it's really astonishing, and I'll try to give you a sense of what's going on. So this is from Victor Ullmann's probably the last composition. Uh, there's a couple he was working on towards the end of August in 1944. Um, he, he and several other composers were sent to Auschwitz on a transport on October 16th, 1944. It's hard to say which was the last piece. Uh, Ullmann uh, was born around the same time as Haas, but a very different background. Haas came from a Jewish family. Uh, Ullmann's uh, parents had converted. He was brought up as a Christian. Um, never paid much attention to any Jewish background, became an anthroposophist, got very interested in the work of Rudolf Steiner, um, really a wonderful musician, studied with Schoenberg, worked with Semlinski, um, and ended up managing an anthroposophical bookstore in Stuttgart in the 1930s before going back to Prague. Uh, he was eventually sent to Terezin, uh, whether or not he thought of himself as a Jew, uh, the Nazis did, and, and off he went, deported to Terezin, where he became a very important person in the camp. He wrote reviews, was critically uh, involved in all the cultural life. And this is his last piano sonata. And it's from the last movement of his last piano sonata and the last variation in that movement. So the last movement of Uman's piano sonata is a theme and variations on, on, a, on a Hebrew song. Here's Uman's uh, theme. <laughs> the Hebrew song that he based it on. Again, he chooses this song, and it, it's interesting. I hope you can hear the piano. Um, here's what the original song sounded like. It was written by Yehuda Sharet. The words are, look, Rachel, her blood flows in my blood. Her voice sings in that of mine. Rachel, who tends Laban's flock. Rachel, mother of the mothers. And, and here's the original song by Sharet. If you listen to the harmony. Here's Ullmann's version. So he's got that kind of Hebraism built into it. So this is, again, variations and fugue on a, a Hebrew folk song. So that's the, the opening. And then the last variation in which this occurs is a fugue based on the subject. So. He makes it a major key, and I'll play the fugue, I'll point out the openings. heard me talk lately knows that I'm I'm a middles guy. Uh, I think all this strange, unusual, unprecedented stuff goes on in the middle. And, you know, the fugue is going along with, with all the voices referring to the opening Rachel song. And then suddenly everything stops. Okay, 
so right in the middle of this fugue, everything stops and who walks in the door? Bach, right? And we know that this B-A-C-H in, in German uh, musical notation, B is B flat, A is A, C is C, and H is B natural. Right? And this, this is a kind of cipher, different composers uh, had ciphers, and Dmitry Shostakovich had DSCH, and uh, so this is, so about 400 compositions from Bach's time onward have made use of this little cipher, B-A-C-H. Bach, of course, used it first in his own compositions, then his sons used it, Telemann uses it, uh, and in our time, Schoenberg and many other composers uh, have variations or pieces, chorales, based on this B-A-C-H motive. So Bach enters. He stops everything. Forte, Bach enters, right? Okay, then we have in the bass, we have the Rachel theme in the bass. But then above that, we have something uh, unusual. Um, if one of the sort of war cries of the Reformation was, with those repeated notes, one of the war cries of Czech nationalism was an invocation of a 15th century Hussite song, Ye Who Are God's Warriors, Gdosh Ste Boji Oyovnitz. And here we have that appearing in the top voice. Um, and I will kind of give you a little, a little taste of what it sounds like. <laughs> the Czechs were looking to their past for heroic figures. They looked to the Hussites, the followers of Jan Hus, who was executed, burned at the stake in 1415, and his followers became a military force, and this forceful hymn became a warrior, kind of a battle cry. So if looking at B-A-C-H might give us something of a, of a sense of the trajectory of German musical traditions, this gives us some sense of Czech musical traditions, and I've put them all into a, one little short uh, clip, and you'll hear four different iterations of this. The first, and maybe the most powerful, is its invocation in Smetana's opera Libusha, where at the end of the opera, the priestess Libusha gives her prophecy for the future, uh, and she looks ahead and she says, ah, oh, the storms will rage around us, but only they stand firm, they being the Hussites. And then you'll hear the Hussite hymn. Then there'll be a little pause and I'll play a little fragment of Dvorak's uh, Hussite overture. Another pause, uh, its use in Janacek's opera, the excursions of Mr. Brocek, especially the excursions of Mr. Brocek to the 15th century. And the last thing you'll hear is a kind of secreted version of it in Pavel Haas's Unfinished Symphony. So here we go, some, some Hussites on the way. <laughs> sure there are as many invocations of the Hussite song as there are of the B-A-C-H motive, but there are dozens, maybe maybe more than a hundred. So Oman is uh, attaching himself for 
whatever reason to that tradition. And then we have in the base here, um, re reflections and reminiscences of a chorale. And there's some discussion about which chorale it is. And uh, some people think it's this one. And others think it's this one. So there's some kind of chorale that keeps coming back in the bass. Maybe it's a mixture of both of them. So we have this moment in what's really, we'd call it a quadlibet, uh, actually, in, in some ways. That is to say, well, I, I'll give you an example of a kind of super quadlibet, a famous one. This is the famous coda at the end of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony in a double fugue where all the themes from the movement and some from parts of the symphony come flooding back all together at the same time. <laughs> So um, what does it all spell when you put it together? Well, I thought about it very deeply. And so I can tell you with authority that I don't know. Uh, and I don't think anybody does either. Uh, people have tried to relate it to Ullman's study of anthroposophy, some balancing of diverse elements. Uh, some have seen the Bach motive as an attempt to reclaim real German art from the Nazis. Some have seen it as the coexistence of all these things, uh, the harmonious coexistence of all these things in, in Terezin. Uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating moment, but, but not one that, that yields to any kind of, of simple uh, uh, interpretation. And of course, what you bring to the table often conditions what you're looking at. Uh, uh, Catherine's dissertation, which she just defended, had questions about what happens when we impose sort of redemptive motives on these things, and then we, we wish to see everything in a certain light. But if you step back from something like this, uh, at the very least, it's a fascinating piece of music to contemplate. The third slide is... Um, uh, for me, it, it's my sort of to be or not to be, um, uh, or, or Mona Lisa. It, it's something that I've been thinking about it and studying for an awfully long time. Um, it occurs in the middle movement um, of the last piece that was written in Terezin before these composers were deported. It's written by Gideon Klein. Uh, Klein was born in, in 1919 in Moravia, in a place called Pshedov, uh, was a you know, gifted, gifted young prodigy, so much so that at the age of, of 12, uh, he went off to Prague with his sister to study, uh, was, was really a kind of superstar as both a piano virtuoso, a budding composer, and also, if you'll forgive the expression, uh, a musicologist. Uh, he wrote a very nice thesis uh, on, on Mozart. At, at Charles University. But of course, he too got caught up in all these events. And while he tried to keep his piano career going in Prague uh, under a, a kind of an assumed name, by 1941, he was deported. He was one of the early first people deported in this sort of Alpau Commando. And um, while in Terezin became quite a powerful force, working with children, accompanying various productions, writing music, teaching people, and being kind of energetic uh, uh, and trying to keep things moving forward. Uh, the trio was probably begun uh, in August of 1944. August 1944 was this moment, uh, the Red Cross had come and uh, by creating a kind of Potemkin village had been given, a, given the place a clean bill of health, everything's fine with these people. Uh, the Nazis during August were shooting the notorious propaganda film that was again another attempt to whitewash and show that everything was okay. We don't know exactly when he began the piece uh, because composers will often indicate when they end a movement and after each movement, Klein tells us uh, when he finished it, but we don't know when he began it. 
But the fact is that this piece was written during a pretty difficult time in Terezin, and at least part of it was written after the huge transports to Auschwitz uh, began in September, actually on Yom Kippur, September 28th, 1944. Uh, this was finished, according to Klein's manuscript, on, on October 7th of 1944, and he was deported to Auschwitz uh, nine days later. Uh, he was one of, he was the only composer who was not immediately put to death upon his arrival, lived for a few months in uh, a, another camp called Frostengrube, and um, was somehow killed, we're not quite sure how, uh, just as the camp was being liberated when vying squads of Red Army and, and returning SS uh, were, were milling around. We don't know exactly, but we know he was killed sometime in January uh, of 1945. Uh, this piece uh, really is, is quite extraordinary. It's got two outer movements in, in a more folk-like uh, language. Uh, than, than he had written before. He, he had uh, been a kind of a modernist. His, his piano sonata and some of his quartet movements, uh, variations in fugue, are in an atonal style. This he returns to a kind of Janatskian style, or for those of you who know him, the, the Czech composer uh, Vítězslav Novák. Um, and the slow movement is a, another theme in variations. Uh, my former student, uh, Jory Devenham, wrote a lot about how something about terezin and being sort of recirculating everything leads to so many variation sets being being written. So this is a variation on on a, a Moravian folk song called the Knezdub Tower. Sounds like. version of it is quite different. It's much darker, the theme. Instead of <laughs> the passage we're going to look at occurs in the middle of the middle variation. And it's an interruption by the cello. And you can see it you can see what it says, I hope, con gran espressione quasi improvisato senza rigore. So I'll play uh, one recording of it. This is, and you can hear the interruption. <laughs> sounded a little fuzzy, um, there's nothing wrong with your speakers. Uh, the fact is, it, it, as you can probably see from above, it's written forte, but also consordino with a mute. So again, when we looked at the Pavel Haas, we saw these sort of contradictory things, crescendo into dolce, and, and forte with a mute. Uh, and that gives it a kind of choked sound uh, that, that is unusual. Uh, and then it says, again, with great expression, as if improvised, without strictness. Um, as you probably know, expressive markings um, basically tell players, do not play it as written. Under no circumstances should you play this as written. Distort it. Distort it in, what dire distort it in the direction of your sense of expression, right? So here's another version of, of the same solo. This is the last piece he's writing. He's writing it as this transports are going out to Auschwitz. Um, it, 
it says with great expression, but what's being expressed? Do, do we know? How, how would we know, right? Well, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, let's look at the solo. Right? So this, just like the tune, which begins, we get this. down two octaves, all forte. And then it goes very slowly up, I mean, not slowly, but softly. And there we have this figure of a kind of lament. So if one talks about witnessing, here's a witness at this key moment, he's putting it into sound, but the question is, what does it mean? How do we, what can we get out of it? Um, so one thing is that uh, he wrote a madrigal shortly before he wrote this, where there's a cry in the middle, a kind of interruption that says, I'm miserable here. I don't like living here. So it seems to embody a certain kind of frustration, a certain kind of frustration linked with lament uh, that, that comes out of this moment, uh, a particularly passionate, it could even have a text that we don't know about. But again, uh, the fact that it says with great expression, improvised without, makes it seem like some kind of a speech act, but a speech act that is in effect beyond speech. And I'll say one more thing about it, because it's forte and with a mute, in order to play it, you almost have to reenact, I mean, this sounds fashionable, but you almost have to reenact physical trauma by going diddle, 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 as if you're, you're shaking. Um, I, I thought I'd draw your attention to two images um, that give us a sense of Klein. So uh, a painter named Charlotte Bereshova uh, in the summer of 1945 painted the, the one on the right, which is, the way people thought of Klein, which was composed and elegant, perfect part in the hair. I mean, you're, you know, you're in, you're in a ghetto and, and, and yet he's, he's dressed as if he's, he's ready to go out on the town. Um, I believe that this painting served as a model for the other one by Petr Keen. Petr Keen, who was the librettist for the Emperor of Atlantis. And that the second painting is, is an inner psychological portrait of Klein at the time. The external Klein may have looked like the one on the right, but the internal Klein looked at the, like the one on the left. And that's the one who created this solo interruption, uh, which is again, I think an extraordinary personal, highly personal statement. Um, the last piece is, is much simpler. Uh, it's a piece by Ilse Weber. Ilse Weber was uh, somebody who had studied music. She played the guitar. This is a, a, photo, a little photograph of her with one of these lute guitars that was popular at the time. Uh, she wrote songs and she was a well-known writer of children's stories and poems. She too, uh, she came from a German-speaking family. She was deported to, to Terezin where she worked as a kind of night nurse. Um, and she wrote songs and poems. Um, and one of the problems is that we don't have anything but a few bits of manuscript. For Klein, you know, we have uh, several manuscripts. For Ullmann, manuscripts, Haas. And for her, we just have just a single line um, note. So, so the question is, how, how do we figure out what this sounded like or how to perform it. So I'll play one version of it. It's called Vigala, it's a lullaby. Um, it's almost sort of got little nonsense words. Uh, you know, the wind blows and the moon is a lantern. And, and um, here, here is just one version of it. Vigala, Vigala, Der Wind 
So one could say that that's really the only kind of authentic performance of this that you can get because all we have is a single line of melody and and so but e even with this you could probably tell those of you who are musicians uh, that uh, the singer takes some liberties with rhythms here and there. Well, talk about taking liberties. This is another performance of it. The God of the God of spielt auf der Leier. Er spielt so süß im grünen Ried die Nacht, die Gall. Well, you could probably tell, um, for whatever reason, this singer puts it into duple, quadruple time. It's, it, it, you know, one, two, three, four. So it takes this little waltz and puts it into four. And I think the recording that, that is now considered maybe the most authoritative um, and, and the, maybe the most preferred is this by Am Sophie Mutter. Um, and you can, uh, using a guitar, which is what Ilsa would have used. And here is this. song has become a, a very, very popular song to sing at all kinds of Terezin memorials, Holocaust memorials. This song is performed widely. You can find many recordings. Uh, I wonder if somebody could mute. Uh, somebody's unmuted. Um, yeah, and, and so, and that's a nice performance of it. But there's peculiarities to this song. Um, if you look at it, it just can't get away from E. So we have, you know, keeps falling back. Again. Oh. It, it's a peculiar song in that way that, that it just seems so stuck and it keeps falling that beat off, that that fall so on the one hand you have um a, a extremely sort of lovely little melody which seems to be airy and light and it just it's stuck it is so stuck on that e so i think what we don't know what chords ilsa would have played it it could you could play this with just three chords. <laughs> Only one dominant chord, one measure from the end. Well, what they try to do in this recording, I can't say it's wrong. I said she didn't, uh, Ilsa doesn't leave us little tabs, but to, she, they do, they want to lighten it. They want to make that, that descent, this, so it's instead of, and then it gets very pretty. I get it. I get what they're trying to do, 
but it, it, it sounds to me almost like a, a kind of very subtle equivalent of, again, another redemptive narrative that's being imposed on this song, which is what makes the song, I think, it is the tension between all these light images and, and this dark minor key song that can't get away. It, it's almost a metaphor for being imprisoned that you just can't get away from, from that E. So in conclusion, I just want to say that um, each of these we also, sorry, Maida, could you mute? Um, oh, sorry. Um, e each of these um, has, a, a, to me, a different echo to, to, to where we are today. Um, when, when Haas says, you know, essentially, this is a commemoration of the first year in Terezin and may sort of and may it be the last it, it seems to me that you know um, you know let's let's enjoy these enforced zoom lectures and may it be may it be the last may it may it not continue with Oman, I think there's something else that really that really speaks to me it, it's that all these tunes cheek by jowl are a kind of symbolic representation of of the actually the impossibility of social distancing in a place like Terezin. that that the zionists and the germans and the czechs they, they couldn't get away from each other so even though one could take a very light interpretation of the Ulman as the balance of all these peoples. It, it's also a sense that they're all thrown together cheek by jowl and they can't get away from each other. There's no way. They have to learn how to survive together. Klein's outburst goes along with a text that came to us one year after Klein was killed when his girlfriend, Irma Semetska, who had brought this manuscript out of Terezin and given it to Klein's sister, reports Klein in the summer of that year had this outburst like, I can't stand it here. I'm so frustrated. Um, you know, I, I see my whole career going up in smoke. I was looking. So, so this moment also, maybe not quite in the same way, maybe not with the same kind of intensity, but so many people are having to put their lives on hold and waiting to find out when can they go out, when can they make a living, and, I, and that resonates to me very much when I think of Gideon Klein and Terezin. And finally, um, Ilsa Weber, we don't know a lot about her, but we do know that she voluntarily went to Auschwitz with the children she was looking after, including her own son, and, and that she was gassed when she arrived with them. And there's even a story, and again, there's no way to prove it probably apocryphal, that this was a song, that Vigala was a song they sang uh, as they went into, into the gas chambers. Again, who, who, who would know that to tell it? But this is a story that, that it circulates. And, and I also, when I think of her as a nurse, taking care of her patients, taking care of the kids, it, it really does remind me of the many, many people who are on the front lines today uh, maybe it's not as ghastly as during that period, but, but still pretty horrific, uh, who are there on the front lines, many of whom have died because of their sense of responsibility of looking after their patients. So uh, in, in the words of Pavel Haas, again, uh, we hope that this is the last time it's an enforced coming together via this technology and that in the future, it'll be something we can choose to do, uh, but not something we're forced into. Thank you very much. And now, I would be very happy to take questions. If, any, if anybody wants to unmute and ask questions, uh, I, I will try to, uh, David. Yes, well, first of all, thank, thank you very much, Mike. This was really fascinating and wonderful examples. Um, really, really great talk. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, I forget quite what you call it at the beginning, you know, the Terezin something or other paradox or, or something, but 
you know, this idea of crescendo to dolce or playing with the mutes, but playing forte or fortissimo, these kinds of unlikely, um, uh, you know, extremes put together. I mean, do you, could you talk a little bit more about that? Some other examples or why you think this is characteristic of terracine music and what's characteristic about it? Just well, elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, again, you know, as science, it's always tricky because, you know, it really depends on the size of your control group. So there weren't that, you know, if there were a thousand compositions in terracine that all exhibited this and then, uh, hundreds of thousands outside that didn't, uh, then it would be a science proposition. But it, it's my strong sense looking at these things that, that there, you find them in, in Haas's Chinese songs, all these kinds of ambivalent instructions as if they're sort of fighting their way through. Again, crescendos that, that don't really go anywhere. Um, uh, Gideon Klein's music is filled like that. Um, the the lo Gideon Klein's lullaby uh, again, which sort of ends with the word morendo, uh, where, where you, you, you often have a kind of symbolic clash between an implied sense of gaiety and then, as, as in the Ilse Weber song, some, some darker force pulling down. Now, one has to be extremely careful because, well, we know it's terazine, so it's easy to say that because we project that. But it, it seems to me that it, in some of these pieces, particularly the ones I chose, because I think they're better examples of it, but also in Ullmann's work, uh, in, in Ullmann's final melodrama, there are many moments like that that are really quite ambiguous, where you have to really, where, where you actually wonder um, about, you have to think hard about how to play it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not something you, just, you know, and I've seen players go, oh yeah, I know how to play this cello patch. No, no, no. Think about it. Think of what's going on here. Think of the dynamics. Think of the fact that it's muted. Um, and so again, I, I, you find it throughout. Uh, you find it in, um, in Krasa's uh, final piece is called Dance. And, um, you know, you're in, you're in this kind of Moravian dance, bam, bam, ba, 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 and then suddenly there's, there's the kind of thing like you'd have in, in a film, a slow dissolve, and, and you're sort of in a lullaby in Manius race. So it's this whole question of how do these, how do these antagonisms work together? Mm -hmm. Thanks. More questions? I can't see the other screen, so if you're please uh, feel free to ask me anything. Yes, Claire, of course. There you are. Yes, please unmute and ask. No? Is anyone more questions? Okay, I will jump in if I may. Um, Thanks so much for such a great talk. I wanted to ask you about Ilza Weber's piece. So, of course, I'm interested in these redemptive narratives. And I wondered if you think the popularity of Vigula is due to this accompanying story that the claim that she sang this going to the gas into the gas chambers. And I've actually um, been able to sort of trace that narrative back to a single survivor who uh, related this to her husband. So I just wonder again with this sort of these redemptive narratives. Do you think that's part of why this song is so popular? And then also this sort of high art versus low art um, in Friesenstadt and, and how it's received today and performed today. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's always hard to say. Thank you very much for that. Uh, again, this is Catherine. We should all congratulate. Just finished her PhD defense a half an hour. Well, now an hour ago. Uh, so congratulations. Um, well, I have a great advisor, so thank you. Um, <laughs> So I think, I mean, there are all kinds of things. First of all, I think it's, I think it's a beautiful little text. And I think she was a gifted poet. And so I don't, you know, it's hard for me to know why. I, I think it, it does feed into a certain kind of sentimentality. Um, and it, again, uh, there are a lot of ways to hear any piece. And what I was trying to sort of think about was the, the, the I, I can't say exactly what it means, but the way one's attitude towards the piece when you have just a single line melody will condition the way you you sort of harmonize it and and that so creating this sentimental harmonies pretty harmony you know those 
those kinds of things rather than a starker harmony it is, is a choice that probably is based on some notion of a narrative rather than simply the, the musical reality of the piece. Anyone, anyone else? Like I said, it's, I can't, I can only see one of the three screens, so I can't see if anybody is, is waving their hand. But yes, please, uh, Larry Wolf. Hey Mike, that was really great and really interesting and really moving. A um, couple questions. Um, the extreme referentiality. Um, we talk a little bit about um, that in the context of the 30s and 40s. And I'm a little bit interested in relation to that, whether how you would place this in the context of mid-century modernism. That is, is there a Teresine modernism that we could, you know, be talking about here? And also in relation to that, do you, I mean, when you think about, you know, Czech history at this moment, one of the things you think about is um, the complexities of different national strands intersecting. And I guess I'm a little curious whether you see that reflected in Terracine music, that is to say an attempt to sort out and work through German music, Czech music, Jewish music, self-consciously, and think about how they fit together at, that, at this moment. Great. Well, okay, so let's start at the beginning with the idea of extreme referentiality. Um, while I think you find it elsewhere, you don't find it in as concentrated a way, I think, as you find it in Terezin. That You know, it, it's, it's, again, almost as if <clears throat> um, because they couldn't go out and they couldn't really be influenced by outside things, that it, it was this sort of the same thing circulating around and around, uh, you know, little collage mentality, and wh whether it's in Ullmann or Klein or Krasa or Pavel House, little quotes. Now, I will say that that part of it may not only be Terezin. It could be simply a response to repression because Pavel Haas starts doing this even before he's deported. So his, his um, uh, unfinished symphony is filled with references to, to the Horst Vessel song, to, to the Hussites, to St. Wenceslas, to, to many different things. And, and so he brings that with him to camp and he's already doing that. And you can hear it echoing in his Chinese songs. It's all through Klein. Um, now, some of these like Oman's an extreme example of what you're talking about of sort of maybe working through aspects of nationality. But I think this, this was not uninteresting to, to the rest of them. If you look at Klein, uh, Klein set German texts and was criticized by some for setting Hudlin uh, as, as a Jew. Um, he, he said Hebrew texts, uh, both little songs, but also this phenomenal lullaby, Shchad Beni, uh, which I've written about. And of course, then um, he gets very interested, perhaps under the influence of Pavel Haas, uh, he becomes, if you'll excuse the neologism, which will be forgotten after I say it, uh, re-Czechified, um, you know, that, that, that he, He's, he's really more like, when he gets to the camp, he's more like seemingly an apostle of Alban Berg. Uh, he's, uh, or maybe Haba writing sort of difficult atonal music. And I think if there's another strain in Terezin, it's that many of these people who had considered themselves modernist and may have had the modernist concept of avoiding any way of pleasing a mass audience, that this was anathema to modernists, that you would, that you're, in any way your first thought would be how to please an audience, that somehow they found themselves at a moment where they felt they needed to communicate something. So they try, had to find a way of integrating that, that modernist language with other things that they knew. So in, in the, um, so the, uh, the last piece that, that Haas writes, the one that's memorialized in, in the propaganda film, uh, the, uh, the, the piece for strings, um, it's filled with a combination of, of modernist moves, but also sort of Janachkian use of dance rhythms. And I think that's what Klein picks up in the trio. So, so I, I do think there, there is thought about that. 
Um, I thought about it a lot, if you don't mind, to sort of, and this is somewhat, I mean, a difficult thing, but it's uh, the, the last sighting of Klein um, was uh, in, probably in Fürsten Grubo after he's been sent from Auschwitz. And, and it's, it's a story from his biography uh, that he was uh, in, in a room with many other people. And uh, they were all standing naked waiting for a medical exam. There was a piano in the room. And uh, an SS officer said, uh, who plays the piano? And Klein volunteered and sat down and played something. And um, the, the witness uh, named Hanu Schimmeling, who, who the survivor, told this to uh, Milan Slavitsky, Klein's biographer. And um, he said, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a, um, a musician, so I, I don't know what it was he played, um, but it was something serious. And we were all surprised because we thought Klein might play something light, like a dance to please the SS officer, get some privileges, but he played. And then when, when pressed by, by Slovitsky, he said, maybe Beethoven or Bach. So, so it could be in his last moments, his last concert, he sat down and played German music. Uh, and, and so that, that is another way of kind of integrating these national things. More? Uh, Professor Beckerman, there's actually a question in the chat. Okay. Um, that, would you like me to read it? Uh, let's see. Oh, this is, from, this is from Claire? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a connection between this sort of ambiguity of instruction, muted fortes, etc., and the resistance to redemptive narratives, which is an important ethical factor in these things? I don't know. Something to do with the impossibility of expressing trauma. Um, okay. Uh. Um, I think so. I, I, I think um, both Klein and Haas and Krasa and to a certain extent Ullman worked against the grain. That the, the, the natural way of setting this particular text would have been a certain kind of redemptive sweep and instead, um, you know, Haas suggests something not only that results in a different interpretation, but actually, if you'll forgive the expression, requires thought. And I was saying just, you know, when we were talking at, at uh, uh, Catherine's uh, defense, one of the things that, that bothers me about these so-called redemptive narratives is that they banish the idea that music is also about ideas. And, and they just make music all, and you can see that actually in responses to COVID, that people are using music as if only value of music was was something emotional, some kind of emotional rush, uh, and uh, you know, elegiac, and in, instead of something that really forces you to think, that could be philosophical. Now, in Ullmann's case, Ullmann deliberately does these kinds of things, right? Because you can't figure out what he means. It's not. It's never. It's never going to yield itself to a simple, oh, let me just experience this and let, you have to think, what could he possibly mean? What does it mean when Bach interrupts and in come the Hussites and does it mean anything? How does it, so I think that's one thing I would say that that is, to go back to Larry's question, that is a kind of Terezine style, which is thoughtful music, music that really requires, um, requires listeners to think about what's going on. So yeah. Yes, Fred, great to see you. You have to unmute. You have to unmute, Fred. Fred. Yes. Ah, there Thank you are. You. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you. Fred was, Fred was in Terezine, and he's an a absolutely wonderful painter. So thank you Thank for coming. Thank you. You are stressing composers, but there was an audience. So if I may include myself as one of the voices in the audience, I'm a painter, not a writer, not a composer or musician. We, the audience, loved whatever was performed. The, very, the several operas, for instance, Bartlett Bright, among others, in concert form with a rickety piano, 
sung by top voices of Europe and on, in addicts. It was a very small audience at most times because there was a closure at eight o'clock, everybody had to be back in his barracks. What comes to my mind mostly, and I was involved in it in a very roundabout way, is the Verdi Requiem that was performed several times and became a very important part of the Terezin music scene, not from the composer's end, but from the audience's end. Now, there was a big question of how come the Requiem was allowed? And there's a lot of literature about it. Obviously, the text of the Requiem says, Dies ire, dies illa, that is, we were singing the Requiem for the Nazis. Now, uh, I'm glad you stressed the composer part, but the performance of these people, of, of us, the inmates, with, with the genius of uh, Raphael um, Schechter, Schechter uh, putting that choir together again and again after each transport lost the significant part of their audience, of their singers. He, Raphael, Rafik, started all over again. And he actually didn't perish in Auschwitz. I understand that he survived the selection but died in one of the marches afterwards. I don't know which one it was. In. I, by some miracle, survived and then became a painter, but quite involved in the Rafa, in the Requiem as a, as a participant cleaning up. I was a play, one of the group that cleaned up afterwards. Mm -hmm. It is just emptied the room, usually in the attic. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm quite involved in it. I'm 96 now, so my memory keeps fading, but not that one. Well, Fred, well, thank you so much for, for that comment, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to see you. Yes, I know that there are at least uh, two or three people on this screen here who know more about the Faraday Requiem performances than I do, probably not the way you do. Uh, and it's, it's been a kind of fascinating, uh, a fascinating process of both audiences and academics trying to come to grips with, with this. And, and also trying to understand the impact that it had at the time and the reasons it was performed and, and how people responded to it uh, in, in very powerful ways. So I don't know if there's anybody else who would, who, who would like to make a comment uh, about, about it in any way. Uh, Karen, would you like to say something? Yes, why don't you unmute? Karen has, has worked with the uh, Verdi Requiem Project. Yes, uh, Fred, Thank you for that comment. You kind of said a lot of what I would have mentioned much more beautifully, I think, than I will say. Um, but throwing it back to Mike a little bit, the one thing I wanted to sort of wonder if you could comment on too is in addition, it, a lot of this music, you sort of have these different narrative perspectives. And I'm trying not to get too theoretical with like narrative theory in music. Um, but this idea, you have an audience perspective, you have a composer perspective, you have a performer perspective, but especially like in the case of Ullman, where we have his written critiques and we have writings that he did about musical performances there. So um, in that sense, when we sort of have the documentation to analyze music, the musical performances or the pieces itself, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit into sort of how that will play into how we view the narrative of the music from Terzin, um, where we're looking at sort of what people were writing at the time about what was happening. Well, end. you know, one of the problems is, I, I don't want to sidestep that question, I'll get back to parts of it, but one of the problems is, is that a lot of these pieces that we're looking at weren't performed, <clears throat> right? So one's view of Gideon Klein um, I was just talking about, you know, uh, 
H.G. Adler, who you know had enormous influence, um, basically said, and I, I you know said this earlier. Well, Klein's morbid aestheticism was seen as spiritual depth. I mean, God, if anybody said that about me, that would be the end. I'd be right out the window. Um, and and so, um, but he didn't know the trio, right? And so. And, and Ullman's, you know, the Ullman's piano pieces, the late ones, weren't played. So, so the the question is, is also how do we, how do we deal with these pieces where there's no composer commentary, right? Because we don't expect that Klein is going to have little arrows saying secrets here, <laughs> right? The whole point of, well, I mean, again, one of the things that is very tricky to figure out, um, and I don't want to slide away. I will get back to it. Is just how much oversight censorship was there and by whom? Who did they have to be afraid of? How much self-censoring went on there? One of the things which is really curious is that on, on the manuscript of Klein's trio, there's a word that's been erased on, on all th three final pages of each movement. And we think that the word is terazine, you know, because maybe it, if you were carrying around music manuscripts after the war, it wasn't good to be seen with anything that said, Terezine, in case the wrong person picked you up. So the whole question of that. Now, um, I, I, I don't want to be catty and say that if we've gotten to the point where we're writing history using only the critics as our evidence, um, we're, we're in trouble. I mean, you know, I mean, I, another thing is to come to grips with someone like Ullmann. Right. Um, because on the one hand, you could, you, I mean, depending on what side of the bed you get up in the morning, you could see Ullman as, uh, how amazing is it? He's, he's like fighting in this difficult situation to create something, or you could think that he's delusional and, and you know, he doesn't know where, and he's writing criticism as if he's in Vienna. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's a kind of tricky thing to get your head around what, what they're doing. I think his criticism is, is fascinating. And I think it does give insight into certain kinds of things, he, but, but he was often hearing these pieces for the first time and, and I guess my point would be to go back to several questions, that Claire's question and others, is that people, composers were thinking in a different way. And I'll give you sort of a bad analogy that could be historically wrong. But so, it, you know, Beethoven begins to go deaf and, and his style of composition changes. And from, from what I know about that kind of disease and deafness is that deafness can impact compositional memory so that Beethoven could no longer remember things as well as he did before that, and, and in effect had to invent Beethoven, a Beethovenian mode of thick sketching because of, of that deficit. And to some extent, I think the situation in Terezin did cause composers to think in a different way. Uh, and, and maybe this is a self-serving academic uh, approach. I could, I, I would accept that criticism, but that these are pieces that some of them that really have to be studied. They're thick. They're thick with many layers of meaning, and it's unlikely that even the most astute listener is going to be able to pick that up. And while these pieces actually do work as music, um, they also work as philosophy and in other kinds of ways. So, I, I would that would be my response. But thank you. More? Uh, there's one more in the chat from Jiri Polak. Oh, Jiri. Asks, can you comment on the relation between the everyday life and the music composed in Terezin? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, it's always a tricky one because it, it's like when people talk about the late style, is there such a thing as a late style in music? And then the, the problem is that, that often we're talking about exceptional people. So, the, I mean, the people I'm talking about are, are really exceptional musical thinkers. So it's hard for me to know what their relationship was like to everyday life. Um, I, I don't know whether Yirji means, in general, ev music in everyday life in Terezin, uh, or, or specifically with these figures, because as Fred said, and as, as has been commented on many, many times, uh, one, of the, one of the things when we think about Terezin, because of the vibrancy of the musical life there, and, and it comes to us 
even now as studying it for a long time as a surprise that that some a, a, a musical culture of this vibrancy could have flourished in that place that we probably tend to overrate the number of people who are able to participate in it uh, and that it was actually a small and i've spoken to many survivors who say no, i never got near any of those places i could never get a ticket uh, or or people who said um sort of memorably, Zuzana Rozhitskova, the harpsichordist, said, uh, I said, well, did you go hear Klein's concerts? And she said, no, that, that would have been the same time as my Greek lessons. So, so, I mean, you know, one has to continually readjust one's view of a place like this, which, which went between normalcy and, and the most surreal circumstances you can imagine, uh, almost at, at, at the drop of a hat. Um, so, so I think that's... Um, the, the idea of everyday life, uh, I mean, there were horrific things, right? One of the things that Klein ranted about was how horrible it was when, when they started beautifying the camp in 1943 in, in anticipation of the Red Cross visit, 1944, 43, and that there was a band playing in the band shell all the time. Um, Klein found the sound of that band abhorrent because he knew it was a fake, but that's not to say that other people, and, and that's, that's another thing I, I would say too, which is, you know, we, we also labor with this illusion that, that there are these collective responses to music because we're, you know, in an audience together, except nowadays, but okay, but we're in an audience together. And, and that, but I, I think it's much more likely that responses are completely individual, depending on, on what, what lullaby tune you were sung as a child and, and what your personality and predispositions are and that everybody has a kind of unique response to it. So even with this idea of music in everyday life, you could have had 10 people listening to the same band playing in the band shell and would have been, you know, 10 different experiences from Klein's disgust to somebody else's delight. Good. Well, if there are no more questions, I, I hate saying goodbye to so many people who I enjoy seeing, but I th oh, think the time has come. Thank you so much for your kind attention. If anybody has further questions of any kind, please send them to either me or Kirsten, and I will give you a long, tedious written answer instead of the equivalent uh, oral answer. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. And just to mention, I put it in the chat, but if you're looking for the recording, it will be available in the coming weeks on our website, which I did reference in the chat for everyone. We will be captioning the video, so it'll take a couple weeks to get it up. But after that, you'll be able to access it. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, and thank everyone. you, Professor Beckerman. Bye-bye. Mike and Kristen. Bye-bye. <laughs>